In today's Western culture, more and more youth are either saying no to traditional marriage or are delaying this decision. Young people today want to complete their educations, establish their careers, make sure they're financially stable, maybe travel the world. And once these things have been achieved, some people, but certainly not all, will seek to marry. As a result, marriage as an institution has been undergoing radical change. For instance, the median age of first marriage for women in Canada has increased to 30, and for men, it has increased to 32. Today, many young people are able to support themselves financially, and they don't feel the need to get married to secure their economic futures. Think of this as you may, but it does represent more choice and more independence. It is expected that overall marriage rates may decrease to as low as 70%, and an unprecedented number of millennials are expected to remain unmarried through to age 40. In our Western culture, if and when we choose to marry, it's a conscious choice about who we want to spend the rest of our lives with. It's a choice about love, about fulfillment, about enrichment, and about lifelong companionship. These Western perceptions about marriage are incredible ideals. But unfortunately, this is not a luxury that people everywhere in the world enjoy. In some corners of the globe, marriage is perceived differently. Sometimes, marriage is a means of realizing one's needs rather than being about love and enrichment. And sometimes, marriage is a means to an end. These ideas may seem a little odd to you right now, and that's okay. To illustrate the dramatic contrast to marriage in our Western context, let me share with you two stories. This is Zena. Zena is a 14-year-old girl. Zena and her family were displaced from Syria after the war started, and they settled in Lebanon. And not long after they settled, Zena's parents informed her that they had accepted a marriage proposal on her behalf. And before Zena knew it, she was married to a 47-year-old Lebanese man that she had only barely just met. And now, at the age of 15, rather than go to school, Zena does the household chores, and she cares for her newborn son. How does this story make you feel? Did these parents actually marry their 14-year-old daughter to a man more than three times her age that they barely knew? Did they not know that Zena ought to be in school, that she's still a child and she's not mature enough to be a parent? Did they not realize that this was against Zena's rights? How does this story make you feel? Does it make you feel enraged and indignant? Let me introduce you to Zena's parents. Their pre-war life in Syria had been very happy. They both worked and they owned a home in a safe neighborhood. Zena excelled in school and wanted to be a nurse or a doctor when she grew up. But as the fighting escalated, they both lost their jobs, and so they decided it would be best to flee. Zena's family experienced discrimination in their daily lives and feared for their safety in Lebanon. School fees were, were prohibitively expensive, and classes were taught in a different dialect of Arabic that made it difficult for Zena to keep up with her peers, and so she was no longer able to go to school. Unemployment rates were extraordinarily high, and no one seemed willing to hire Syrians. The Lebanese government had refused to set up refugee camps for displaced Syrians, and so Zena and her family were forced to live here in a tent in the Bokal Valley. You will note that there's no electricity, there's no running water, and there are no toilets. Zena's family rents the land on which the tent is set up. But because they have no money to pay, they are obliged to work for the landlord on his farm. 
Even children as young as age eight work on the farm for as little as a dollar a day just to keep their tents and to have a little money for food. So Zaina's parents decided that the best way to protect her, the best way to ensure that she could live a comfortable life, was to marry her to someone who could take care of her. Zaina's mother explained, we were compelled to marry her since we couldn't put her in school, and our financial situation was terrible. She has been married for a year now, and she has a baby. This marriage was forced upon Zaina by her parents, who believed it was in her best interest. After all, it's not like a teenage girl would choose this herself. Or would she? Let me share with you my second story. This is Selma. Selma is a 15-year-old girl who lives in Tripoli, Lebanon. She lives in a one-bedroom apartment with her family of six. Before being displaced to Lebanon, Selma had wanted to become a lawyer. At the age of 15, Selma herself decided that she wanted to marry. It did take a little persuasion, but she was able to convince her parents that she was ready for marriage. And before long, she was engaged to a neighbor who had lost his wife the year before and was left with two young children. And now, at the age of 16, rather than go to school, Selma does the house chores, watches her stepchildren, and is pregnant with her first baby. How does this story make you feel? Did this 15-year-old actually decide to get married? Didn't she know that that would mean giving up her dreams of going to university and becoming a lawyer? Did she not know that having children so young would increase her risk of dying in labor or delivery? Did Selma not know that child brides are at increased risk of intimate partner violence? That the age inequality compounded with the gender inequality would mean that she's unlikely to ever have a voice in that marriage? Let's get to know Selma a little better and to understand what her life was like as a refugee. Selma lived here in this one-bedroom apartment with her family of six. Selma had been pulled out of school after there were credible reports of girls being sexually harassed and after two girls were abducted and raped. School had been the only reason that Selma ever really left the apartment. And so now, not only was there no school, but there was no extracurricular activities. There was no way to socialize with peers or friends, not even running errands, unless she was accompanied by a male adult family member. And so Selma's life, once so promising and vibrant, had been reduced to sitting in the apartment, discouraged and dispirited. Selma explained, after I met my husband, we got to know each other for a week, and then we got married. My parents had imprisoned me at home, and I was not allowed to go out. I wanted to get married, to get away from my parents' treatment, but marriage is even worse. If you could talk to Selma, you would realize how sheltered she felt in her parents' home. Selma felt suffocated, she felt suffocated to the point that although she didn't know that man who had just proposed, she was willing to take her chances on him rather than spend her days imprisoned in the apartment. Zaina's and Selma's stories are taken from research conducted in Lebanon in 2016 in collaboration with the Abad Resource Center for Gender Equality. The research was investigating the underlying factors that were contributing to increased rates of child marriage within the Syrian crisis. If we had asked Zina's parents, do you think it's right or good to marry a girl at the age of 14? They would have most likely said no. And yet the following month or the following year, they may have found themselves in a situation where the best option was to marry Zina at the age of 14. And if we had asked Selma 
three years ago, whether she would be willing to give up her dreams of going to university and becoming a lawyer, to marry an older man that she didn't even know and take care of his children. You probably would have gotten one of those, are you out of your mind, looks that teenagers tend to do so well. The problem with asking these questions is that the world is not black and white. Human beings are innately complex, and the environments in which we live are complicated and ever-changing, perhaps even more so when you live in a refugee setting. So what we believe is right or good is sometimes irrelevant when our circumstances change and we find ourselves in a situation that we could never have imagined. So in our research, we didn't actually ask these or any other questions about marriage, because it didn't matter whether people thought it was good or bad, right or wrong. What mattered was that it was deemed to be the best option at that particular point in time. Instead of asking direct questions, we asked people to tell stories. Storytelling is a natural way for people to convey complex information and a way for people to make sense of their own and their community's experiences. These are the antidotes that people tell their friends about the strange thing that happened in the library last week, or about the unexpected thing that happened at the party last weekend. So we asked girls, their parents, and community members to tell stories about the experiences of Syrian girls in Lebanon. And we then asked participants to interpret their own stories by plotting their perspectives between three different options on a tablet, as shown above. We knew from earlier work that education, safety, and financial resources were issues that were of great concern to the families that we were talking to. In total, we collected 1,422 self-interpreted stories about the experiences of Syrian girls in Lebanon. Each of these blue dots represents how an individual participant interpreted the experiences in their story. As you can see, there was quite a bit of focus about safety as well as about financial security. Zaina's parents just wanted to make sure that she was financially provided for. And Selma's parents just wanted to make sure that she was safe. We started by talking about how marriage is perceived here in Canada as a deep emotional connection to a partner of your choosing. On Maslow's hierarchy of needs, most of us would place marriage at the very top. As we have seen, though, our experiences of marriage are not necessarily shared by others whose life circumstances are very different. Think about Zaina. Think about her family's experience. Remember that they have been displaced, they'd lost their home, they were living in a tent, and they were struggling to find enough food. All Zaina's parents wanted was to ensure that she had adequate warm shelter and to make sure that she wasn't hungry. Think about Selma and her parents. Remember that her parents were worried that she would be attacked, harassed, or sexually assaulted. All Selma's parents wanted was to protect her to make sure that she was safe. And think about what Selma herself wanted. Remember that she was not able to leave the apartment unless she was chaperoned by a male adult family member. Selma felt completely socially isolated. She was just trying to secure that sense of belonging that was so important to her. When you first heard the stories about Zena and Selma, you likely focused on the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you were like me, you thought, how could Zena's and Selma's parents take away their dreams of going to university and having careers? How could they be so short-sighted and limit their futures? But Zaina's parents were just ensuring that her most basic physiological needs were met. And Selma's parents were just making sure that Selma was safe. And Selma herself was just securing that sense of belonging and that ability to socialize that she wanted. So you see, it is through a very privileged lens that we judge Zaina's parents 
and Selma herself. For most of us are fortunate enough that we will never have to make these difficult decisions between meeting our basic needs today and having the opportunity to realize our full potential in the future. These parents want the same things for their children that your parents want for you, and the same things that I want for my children. The only difference is that we face different circumstances and that these circumstances dictate where on the hierarchy we must focus our attention. As we reacted to the stories about Zena and Selma, originally we may have thought the government should introduce new legislation against child marriage. Men who marry child brides should be penalized, or parents who marry their daughters early should be fined. But these strategies are based on a very limited understanding of the circumstances that these families find themselves in. It's not about penalties and laws. Strategies to address child marriage have to focus on the root causes. They have to focus on meeting the basic needs of the girls and their families. Because only once these needs have been adequately met can we reasonably expect people to focus on higher level goals on things like self-esteem and self-actualization. Because at that point, there would no longer need to be a trade-off between meeting your survival needs today and having the opportunity to succeed tomorrow. And marriage would no longer be a means to an end. So the next time you come across someone's decision that you disagree with or that you don't understand, I want you to pause. I want you to take a long pause to think deeply about why people make the decisions that they do, given the circumstances that they find themselves in. As we've discovered, the decisions and actions of others are often based on circumstances that we cannot understand. It wasn't natural for us to think that Zena's and Selma's marriages were in their best interest. But if we can take a step back, to understand and appreciate the motives behind people's decisions and actions, rather than jumping to conclusions and making judgments, then we will be in a better position to help. So I challenge you, the next time you hear a story on the news that on first glance seems absolutely outrageous, or the next time you hear about somebody of a different race, ethnicity, or culture who behaves differently from you, I want you to pause. Because at the end of the day, we are all human. At the end of the day, we share the same basic needs. Zainas and Selma's families are striving for the same things that we strive for. The only difference is the level of needs that we're fighting to fulfill. Most of us are fortunate enough to be focused on higher level goals, but the needs themselves are common and shared across all ethnicities, races, and walks of life. So I urge you to make these small but critical adjustments in your thinking. Focus on our similarities and our shared experiences. Remember your place in the world and the place of others. And be aware of your own biases so that together we can create a positive space for real and meaningful change. Thank you. <laughs>